Right, well, thank you very much um, for the invitation to talk. Um, as um, you've just heard, this, what I want to talk about today is a couple of studies that are literally about to start. So all of the ethics has been approved for both of these studies. Um, we're about to start recruiting in Sussex for both of them. So being as we don't currently have an awful lot of data on them, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a background to the type of work that we've been doing down in Sussex over, over many years that's formed the basis for these two studies. Why are we doing these studies? What is the, you know, the, the theoretical background for why we're going to do these? And then at the end, I'm going to give you a couple of slides showing you the two studies that we're currently involved with. So the, the <coughs> title of my talk then is Using Insights from PNI, this big long-winded word, Psychoneuroimmunology, to perhaps better understand um, fatigue in, in MECFS. That's the wrong way. Okay, so just as a background, a broad background to this field, what am I interested in? What has my group been looking at over the years? Well, it's really these things called sickness behaviors. So whenever we get the flu, we, 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 our behavior changes. We become typically a little bit more fatigued. We stay at home. We don't engage with other people. We might find there's some slight cognitive impairments. And this is something that anyone will experience whenever they, whenever they, they get the flu. And this is just a very simple schematic that I've shown here, showing on the left-hand side sort of a very cartoonized version of the immune system. And this is carefully coordinated to fight the infection at the level of the body, but, but it's believed that these sickness behaviors are, are integrated to help us fight the infection as a whole organism. Okay, so our behavior changes to help our body fight off the infecting organism. And what are sickness behaviors? I mean, I've talked about them already, and you can introspect and, and, and guess probably a number of these different sickness symptoms. But they're things like, well, typically a bit of anorexia, so we typically stop eating, perhaps uh, drink a little bit less. We have experiences like fatigue, experiences like anhedonia. So sometimes what we'll find is that we're less enthusiastic about doing things we previously did. If we enjoy, I don't know, going out to a theater or seeing friends, we're less likely to do that. We just lack if you like, the, the reward-related activity. These are very subtle changes, but they're subtle reductions in anhedonia. And we've done numerous studies looking at the brain basis for some of these, some of these changes. Some of the other things are psychomotor slowings. We find our movements are a little bit slower whenever we get <coughs> infected. Um, and also other things like pain hypersensitivity. So whenever we get an infection, and there have been nice studies showing this, our sensitivity to certain types of pain, pressure pain, for example, actually goes up. So we become more sensitive to pain. So I think you can see already in this description of sickness behaviors why we're particularly interested in this as a potential model um, for MECFS. And just Carmen has already talked about this, so he's given you a nice introduction to this, but you know, in our day-to-day -day lives, typically we get an infection, we get a cold, we're maybe a bit fluey, have these sickness symptoms for a few days, maybe up to a week, we get better life goes on, typically. That's a typical situation. But the atypical situation is what Carmen was describing a moment ago. If you chronically activate the immune system with interferon once a week for six months, there's a proportion of people who uh, have persistent symptoms. There's also quite a proportion of people who develop <laughs> major depressive episodes. So these sickness symptoms are no longer inconvenient. They become uh, indistinguishable from major depression. And patients need to be treated for depression, otherwise they'll stop some of these treatments. So this is quite, you can induce quite profound changes in behavior if you chronically activate the immune system. So how on earth is all this going on then? I mean, if we're activating the immune system in the body, how is it that changes our behavior? I mean, there, there must be some communication going on. And, and again, this has been relatively nicely worked out over the years. There are a number of different pathways that link our immune system to our brains. And this is again a cartoon, this is from Robert Dancer. Um, but there are, if you like, a couple of different classes of, of pathways. One of them is called a neural pathway. So there are nerves within our body. The vagus nerve, for example, is mainly sensory. About 80% of the fibers in the vagus nerve are sensory. And they can, it can sense cytokines within certain parts of the body. So you can see, this point is not terribly good, but whenever we get inflamed or whenever we get an infection, the, the vagus nerve senses that and signals that to the body. And it signals up what's called an interoceptive <coughs> pathway. And this has been worked out in rodents. And in rodents, you can cut the vagus nerve and you can see you no longer activate the system and you lose many of these sickness behaviors. So we know that this is implicated in some of these, these symptoms. <coughs> 
One of the really early studies that we did was in humans, and we activated the immune system with typhoid vaccination. Just a bog standard typhoid vaccination you would get from your GP if you were traveling to, I don't know, say rural India or something like that. And what we see is that we get activation in a human homologue of this pathway. So you activate this intraceptive pathway, and it looks analogous to activating vagal nerve afferents effectively. I mean, this is, this is functional imaging, so we can't get cellular precision with this, of course, but the, the pattern of activity we see is consistent with activation of this intraceptive pathway. And we've replicated that study. So this is um, some other data using a different imaging technique called, called FDG-PET. So essentially, this seems relatively robust, and other groups have shown this as well since, since we first published on this. There are these other mechanisms as well. So that was a neurally mediated pathway. There are also what we call humoral <coughs> Uh, mechanisms. So cytokines circulating in the blood can directly act on <coughs> bits of the brain. And the bits of the brain they act on are these sort of areas in red here, which are the circumventricular organs. The blood-brain barrier is a little bit different in these areas, and it allows closer access to the brain. And interestingly, if you take rodents and you give them interferon, within a few hours you see activation of interferon-sensitive genes in some parts of the brain including basal ganglia, for example, hippocampus, and things like that. So it looks like some cytokines can actually get into the brain quite quickly, um, and certainly interferon alpha would be one of them. And this is just some data from a group at Yale. This is microglia. We heard a bit about microglia yesterday. This is a PET imaging technique um, that, that images activated microglia. And essentially what this shows is this is healthy humans. They're given an immune challenge, some LPS. They're scanned three hours later, and what you can see is this massive activation, apparently, of, of microglia. This is how this is interpreted. There are issues with, with, with this technique, but this has been interpreted as saying these immune cells within the brain, these things called microglia, are activated in all of us whenever we get a, 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 an inflammatory challenge. So one area that I've been particularly interested in is this concept of, of subjective fatigue. So whenever we get inflamed, we experience fatigue, we feel tired. And, and what is the basis of that? And again, I'm going to show you now, this is data from three completely separate studies using different imaging techniques, so fMRI, PET imaging, and the one on the right-hand side is something called QMT, quantitative magnetization transfer imaging. I'm not really going to discuss that, but I'm more than happy to talk about it afterwards. But the bottom line is, is that it doesn't matter what technique you're using here, and these are all separate, independent groups of individuals. When you inflame them, mildly inflame them with a typhoid vaccine, within a few hours you activate this intraceptive pathway. So it seems that insula becomes activated. And interestingly, the degree to which different people activate this pathway correlates <coughs> with how fatigued they feel. So if you're, if you're a lucky person who gets the flu and you just bounce on and you have no problems at all, you are likely to be somebody who doesn't really activate this insular cortex at all. You're not activating this pathway. However, if you're one of those unfortunate people who is completely flat out whenever you get the flu, the chances are, at least from our data, that you are overacting, overactivating this pathway. And this has been shown in these three separate different studies. What do we know about insula? You know, what, what is this? Is this a big surprise? And, and the answer is not really. It wasn't a surprise. This is very much what we predicted in these early studies. And I don't know how well you can see this, but, but it's been argued by an anatomist, a neuroanatomist um, in the States, Bud Craig, that insula provides a representation of all the physiological changes that are going on in our body. So one of these, for example, is graded cooling. So if we cool different bits of the body, we activate this insular cortex. This one down here is dynamic exercise. So of course, during exercise, there's a whole bunch of metabolic changes. And we also see increase, or he sees, increases in activity in insula to all of these different changes within our body. So it seems to be that this bit of the brain here is holding a representation of all these different metabolic changes, uh, physiological changes that are going on in the body. And this point here, the one with exercise, is relevant to one of the studies that we're going to be doing. So just before I move on, the insula isn't just about subjective fatigue. It seems to be that it's involved in a whole host of other different um, activities and functions. And we heard from Mariah Fitzgerald yesterday about, about pain, central sensitization in pain. And, and the insular cortex forms part of the pain matrix, if you like, within the brain. It's an important part of the pain matrix. 
and it also appears to be implicated in these top-down regulations on the experience of pain. So insulin is not just involved in fatigue, but it also appears to be involved in representations of pain. This is some nice data from a group um, in Stockholm, in at the Karolinska, and what they've shown is if you take healthy people, you inflame them, and then you look at their pain sensitivity, they become more sensitive to certain types of pain, particularly pressure type pain. And again, this is relevant to, to um, another one of the studies that we're looking at where we're looking at fatigue and pain in the context of both CFS and uh, fibromyalgia. Okay. <coughs> and then just finally, sort of expanding this idea, and if you like, generalizing this idea a little bit more. This is a study we did again in healthy individuals and we show that this insular cortex also appears to code some sort of punishment prediction error. So how punishing we find something. So you can, you can imagine pain is clearly a punishment. In this case, this is losing money. So the insular is also sensitive to a punishment that's quite abstract. For example, like losing money. So it seems to cross the gamut from something very physiological like pain all the way up to something quite abstracted uh, like losing money. I just quickly want to show that it's not all about the insula. The insula appears to be associated with subjective experiences of fatigue. But other things that we observe when we inflame people is that their motor responses slow down. And that doesn't seem to have much to do with insula. It does <coughs> seem to have more to do with other bits of the brain, like the substantia nigra, that are, that are dopamine-rich parts of the brain. So this concept of fatigue, we often wrap up psychomotor slowing within there, or we don't pull out these different elements of fatigue but it seems that they have different neural bases, um, these separate elements. And then finally, just to confuse the picture a little bit, I want to show you a little bit of data in interferon-induced fatigue. So everything I've shown you before is all typhoid or LPS-induced fatigue. It all fits quite nicely with this insula story. But when we look at interferon-alpha-induced uh, uh, fatigue, something else appears to emerge. And this was a study we finished and published where we we, we um, recruited people who are about to be given interferon for hep C, much like Carmine has already talked about, and we uh, scanned them very acutely. So we, we got them in, and after their first injection, four hours later, they're in the scanner, just at the beginning of when they were beginning to experience fatigue. So their fatigue had already gone up on average at that time point, but it got an awful lot worse four weeks later. And what we wanted to say is, uh, look at is, what's going on in the brain at this really early time point, and can we predict the future? Can we predict who's going to get the most fatigue? And what we observed here was firstly, you can see when I've shown you those other images, this is not the insula. There was almost nothing going on in the insula at all. And what we were observing was big changes within, within the basal ganglia. This is an MT or a QMT sequence. And again, the question is, you know, is this predicted or not predicted? Well, again, the answer was this actually was predicted on the basis of what everyone else has been publishing. So, so there have been other groups, this is Andrew Miller's work, um, using a number of different techniques, but what they consistently show is not anything to do with the insula, but everything to do with the basal ganglia, a different part of the brain that's involved in motivational processing. So it seems that in the context of, of interferon, a different part of the brain is being modulated. And that also predicts, to some degree, the magnitude of, of, of fatigue you're going to experience four weeks later. So in our study, we see changes in this basal ganglia region that predicts the future. It predicts those individuals that are going to get most fatigued. And in these other studies that were published prior to our study, they also correlate with, with also elements of motivation or subjective fatigue. So it seems to be we need to be a bit more accurate about how we're describing fatigue here. It would suggest that perhaps more motivational components are associated with this sort of change going on in the basal ganglia and more subjective experiences with the insular cortex. So this is something we'll be looking at in, in the two studies. Okay, so let me get on to the studies finally. These are the last two slides, and these are very high-level schematics of what we're proposing to do. The first one is in collaboration with Mark Edward, um, not the Mark Edward we have with, here with us today, but another Mark Edward. Um, who is at St. George's, and um, a research fellow, Mahinda, who's working with him, and he's, he's a consultant urologist. And this has been funded by, by the MRC, and what we're wanting to do here is to challenge this system and look at this interoceptive si uh, system, but challenge it with exercise. So the idea is we're going to recruit 
just 20 people with MECFS and 12, uh, 20 control individuals. We're going to do a whole bunch of work up at the baseline. We're going to bring them in. We're going to put them in the MRI scanner, do a range of different tasks, resting state, some structural tasks, QMT. And then we're going to give them um, an exercise challenge task. So it's going to be at about an 8 to 12 minutes challenge task. And then we're going to record uh, some blood samples. We're going to send them home. And then the next day, they're going to come back into the imaging center. And we're going to repeat all of the imaging. And the idea, and of course, the prediction here is that people with MECFS are going to show much more pronounced activation of this interceptive pathway after this exercise challenge compared to healthy control individuals. And there's a range of other sort of secondary outcomes that we're looking at there. The final study, or the second study, is one with Jessica Eccles, who's sitting just on the table over, over here. And uh, <laughs> Jessica is going to be leading this in Sussex with some rheumatology colleague, uh, Kevin Davies. And this, if you like, is, is analogous. But this time, instead of using an exercise challenge, we're using an inflammatory challenge. So again, similar sort of questions. Do people with MECFS show this heightened response or heightened sickness response and heightened activation of this interceptive pathway following a really mild inflammatory challenge? And just typhoid vaccine is a very subtle inflammatory challenge. It maybe doubles or trebles cytokines. This is tiny compared to what you would happen, say, when you got the flu. And so I'm not going to go through all of the details of this study, but I'm sure Jess will be more than happy to sort of elaborate different components of this. But there's about a 70-page protocol, and I'm not going to yeah. give you a 70-page protocol on here. But essentially, she's been very systematic looking at pain and uh, measures of pain and fatigue. So for example, we heard yesterday about the McGill pain questionnaire from Mariah Fitzgerald. That's going to be incorporated. Within this study, she's going to be looking at pressure pain and a whole host of, um, of different immunological measures. There will be two components to this. One bit is an autonomic challenge, so trying to address some of this autonomic hyperreactivity. And then in the second half of the study, this is going to be with this vaccine or this inflammation challenge, so this typhoid vaccination inflammation challenge. So I'm going to wrap up there. I don't know if I'm already in trouble yeah. from going over. No? OK. And, and I'll leave it open. I mean, I've given you a really cursory overview of the two studies, but I'll be more than happy to go into much more detail about exactly what's proposed. So thank you. Well, thank you.